Hello, I'm Randall Pinkston, and this is Ethics Matter. Our guest today has devoted his career to the study of the history, politics, and culture of the former Soviet Union and Russia. He is Jonathan Sanders, who lived in Russia as an academic researcher and as a journalist for CBS News. He taught at Columbia in Barnard. He was the Ferris Professor of Journalism at Princeton University, the founding assistant director of the Harriman Institute. He is also an award-winning filmmaker and the author of numerous articles and books about Russia, including Russia, 1917, The Unpublished Revolution, and Comrade X Was Wrong, Soviet TV coverage of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Your area of expertise includes telecommunications innovation, uh, visual culture and photography and television, and media. So what I would like to know, uh, Dr. Sanders, is what, in your opinion, is the current state of information dissemination in Russia today? Randall, Russia's become a schizophrenic country again. The people who are interested in the world can tune into the world. The internet is ubiquitous. Russia has, especially in its big cities, a very high penetration of high-speed connectivity to the rest of the world. I have students in Moscow as well as out on Long Island at Stony Brook University. My students in Russia read the New York Times more assiduously than people out at Stony Brook read the New York Times. They do not believe their own media. The Russian big media, if we use the word mass media, it's really mass, it's really crass, it's grand, it's concrete. The big television stations, the national networks, are all controlled by the Politburo. They are under the big coarse thumb of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. They do not give much good information. They follow the party line. Every week, usually on Thursdays, there's a gathering of the news executives from these big networks, and the Kremlin basically tells them what to cover. But on the internet, on RuTube, on YouTube, there is dissidence and there's all kinds of things going on. For instance, not too long ago, asked if he was disappointed in his relationship with President Trump. Putin says, I'm not the groom and he's not the bride, and so there's no disappointment. You know, it's not like a marriage. All of a sudden, all across the Russian internet, there were all these memes of the two of them as bride and groom, <laughs> of them, them as, as horse and master. Some of them were kinky, some of them were scurrilous. Most of them would have trouble getting on network television here because they had such a, a sexy edge to them. But there is a great deal of nonconformity in the Russian media. We should not think that the Great Firewall of China is replicated in Russia. Yes, some things get shut down. Yes, they have a total stranglehold on anything that is homophobic in the eyes of the Kremlin. Homosexuality is a really taboo subject there, but in large ways, it's very different from the Soviet Union, and that's on purpose. They do not want to replicate the power that dissidents got in the 60s and 70s and 80s and early 90s in the Soviet Union. So they allow a small group of people to have more or less free expression as long as it does not rise to the level of major media or mass media or big media. Now, Small is good. Now tell me this. Uh, in the old days, there was Pravda, there was Izvestia, um, I don't know the others, but the, the state-owned and state-controlled, correct? Absolutely. And they're still in existence. Uh, Pravda's still in existence. Izvestia is still in existence. Pravda's a shadow of its former self. It used to have like 12 million subscribers because you had to be reading the party newspaper to see what the party was saying. Now, if it has 100,000, it, it's a lot. The real information powerhouse is the national television networks where 70 to 85 percent of the country gets their information. But what's happened is there's this generational split. The people over 35 watch television and hear the party line. 
the people under 35, they've got their mobile devices just like we have our mobile devices. And yeah, a lot of them are just watching rock groups on TV. A lot of them can tell you about what the, what's going on in the Paris catwalk or whatever they're interested in abroad. But some of them are watching news about people who are in opposition to Putin and his regime, who say that he that he is a crook. And there's a man named Alexei Navalny who wants to run against him as president, who says that he is in charge of a party of thieves and crooks. And they watch him. He's a YouTube star. And they say this openly without fear of being arrested? Or well, as much of... fear as I have in talking to you. I mean, you know, yes. I mean, something. Navalny's been arrested a whole bunch of times, yeah. but not for this, for being out in the street and protesting. So you're giving me this impression, this picture of a free speech Russia. It's a free speech for a minority of people who care about it, who do it online. It's not in. It's not in public. It's in people's on people's phones. Okay. It's not. You don't go and see billboards for opposition candidates. But it's there. They have the ability if they want it. The, the clue is most people don't want this. Most people don't want the discomfort, the upset, the tumult of that thing we call democracy. Having been through the 1990s, they want solidity. They want something that they can put their feet down on. They don't want a quicksand society. Most people in Russia actually like what Putin's doing most of the time because he's restored stability. He's brought some kind of economic prosperity. People don't have to worry about how they're going to be able to pay for their grandmother's funeral. That was a problem. He's done away in his harsh, crass, cruel, corrupt, exploitative way. He has put some stability back into the Russian populace, and that's popular, so people don't want to pay attention to these dissidents. So I'm curious about your first news assignment in Russia during the era of the Soviet Union. In totalitarian nations, as most of, of our audience knows, if you are a journalist, there's probably going to be a minder, someone who oh, yes. goes with you everywhere, who's taking notes about who you are talking to and what they're saying to you. Um, to tell me about your experience. Well, well, let me first let me tell you about my minder, and then let me tell you about my first experience. I had a minder. You had to have somebody with you from Gas Radio. And they would facilitate. That's radio. That's a radio. That, that, that state television and radio, radio of the Soviet Union. And this nice woman uh, was there to say no to me and to get into the way. And uh, she would help me with stories and not help me with stories. And I wanted to do all kinds of different stories. I, you know, I do a story about uh, the racetrack inside of Moscow to show where people felt free to yell and jump up and down and cheer and drink and bet. Which was another. I, I like doing those unexpected sides of Moscow. The problem I had with minders is, one, we had common language. And a lot of them were there because they either were on assignment for the KGB or they wanted to practice their English or this, they had to do this for a couple of years. And two, I spoke their language. We were of the same generation. I had done a lot of research in Soviet television about Soviet television. I was kind of in and hep with the people who were doing cutting edge Soviet TV. So if I wanted to do a, a something about this dissonant rock guy, my other friends would arrange for it to happen when they were asleep. Okay, <laughs> so, so that would happen. One of my first assignments for, for uh, when I was full time as a journalist was to cover a group of Jews who were protesting to get out of the country. Mm -hmm. And they would have a demonstration in front of a place where they would get their visas. And we would go out and we would call up the other networks. We always wanted to make sure that we, everyone was there. We didn't care about anti-collusion rules. We wanted to make sure if we got beaten up, somebody, somebody was there to shoot the picture of it. Now, this is when you were working for CBS? This was working for CBS in the, like, 84, 80s. 85. And... Uh, these old grandmothers, I mean, they were as round as they were high, and they were wearing grandma dresses, would come up, and the cameras at that time were these U-matics where you had the, the recorder was separate from the camera, mm -hmm. and they would suddenly, out of their bags, have scissors, and they would cut the cables. <laughs> these were grandmothers in, in, in earning money 
for the KGB to mess with the American correspondents, and they'd start hitting us and yelling at us, dirty capitalists. These were trolls. These were KGB trolls. Hey, we, have we come a long way, baby? Do we have trolls everything, now? Everything they're not is... grandmothers, but they're their grandchildren. That was one of my first uh, experiences. Another early experience was I was working with this amazing group of people at a part of CBS News called Special Events. And they wanted to do three hours in prime time about changes going on in Russia. And they said, hey, Jonathan, can you get us an interview with Mikhail Gorbachev, the new general secretary of the Soviet Union? I said, well, we have some mutual friends, and yeah, I could probably arrange it. But let me tell you about what it's like to interview Gorbachev. You ask him one question, and he'll talk for an hour. And he'll say just what he wants to say in his Gorbachev way, and he'll talk about him. So there's a more interesting guy. You may not have heard of him, but... I think this guy is a real firecracker. I've been reading his speeches. His name's Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin. And they said, who? I said, Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin. Now, mind you, Yeltsin had not done a national Russian TV interview, let alone an international TV interview. And they were really suspicious, and the Central Committee was suspicious. So I went with this wonderful, wonderful producer, Susan Zarinsky, and she and I followed him around for a while, and Susan whipped out a picture of Diane Sawyer and said, this is this lovely young woman's going to interview, and they agreed to do it. And it was a big hit, and it got Boris into a lot of trouble with Gorbachev. They said he was building a cult of personality, and I then had a friend for a life in Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin, and when he got pushed out of power by Gorbachev, I continued to go to see him. I even brought my friend Dan Rather to go to see him. And Yeltsin didn't know who Dan Rather was, but he knew he was a powerful man in America. And the fact that when he was down and out, had been pushed out of power, I continued to pay him uh, courtesies, that I would go and talk to him. That counted for a great deal in Yeltsin's mentality, because in the whole Soviet history, people were pushed out of power, never came back into power. And frankly, I didn't think Yeltsin was going to come back into power. I just liked the guy and found him fascinating. But when he did come back, guess who had access? Yes. Now, tell me about Yeltsin's ethics of governance, uh, Yeltsin's relationship with what you and I would generally call truth, democracy. What was that? Yeltsin was actually, Yeltsin was very, was pretty good about truth. He wasn't very good about uh, corruption. Boris Yeltsin, you might say Boris was a great destroyer. He knew what he was up against. He knew that the Communist Party had been lying to people, had been keeping them uh, in a class system with a very few people on the top living well, that uh, manipulated people's hopes and fears and treated them terribly and shot them. He knew what he was against. He little knew what he was for. What he was for in the greatest sense was I helped arrange for one of his first trips to America. And I made sure that my friends from the Esalen Institute out in California took him to a supermarket with this huge selection of, you know, 25 kinds of Pop-Tarts, all of which had artificial chemicals and things that are bad for you and make you and I fat, but leave that aside. He liked this choice, this affluence, this abundance, and he knew that the empty shelves in Russia he wanted to change. He knew that the Communist Party was oppressive and capricious and corrupt, and he wanted to change that. He didn't know how. He knew what he was against. When individual republics started demonstrating, like Lithuania, for greater freedom, and Gorbachev had a blind eye and a tin ear for listening to nationalism, Yeltsin got it. Take as much liberty as you want. Lithuanians, I'm for your freedom. Uh, and Belarus and, and, and all of those. Latvia, yeah. What he also had was a remarkably thick skin. He would take criticism that people were doing this. He would deal with journalists 
it's a contrast between him and, and Putin. Putin's got very thin skin for criticism. Under Boris Yeltsin, Russia exhibited, let's say from 1991, the end of 91, through 97, maybe through when he resigned on the eve of 99 to 2000, some of the freest press in the world. The criticism that people at NTV, this independent television network that was started and then shut off by, by Putin, the criticism they, they lobbed at the Kremlin about their war in Chechnya in 94, 95, 96 was stronger than anything that Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or David Halberstam or anyone ever lobbed at the U.S. government. It was pointed. It was inflamed. It was incensed. It was infuriating. And he let it go on. That was the good side of it. The bad side was in undoing this monolithic past. He counted on a lot of young people, young men, almost entirely men, who many of them were friends of mine, had gone to Moscow State University with me, who were largely the students of one or two men, the economist uh, Shatalin and some other wizards, uh, academic Arbatov at the USA and Canada Institute, and had ideas about changing things. But no one had ever dismantled a great socialist economic engine while it was still going. And so it, imagine repairing a jetliner while it's flying, being out in the wings. You're going to drop parts. You're going to do some things wrong. There are tremendous forces, and a lot of corruption happened. Let's talk about propaganda for a, a minute, if you don't mind. Um, I. I know you were part of the PBS uh, Red Files project, and one of the papers in that project describes Russia as the world's first modern propaganda state, that Lenin and other Bolsheviks whipped up political resistance with slogans, songs, speeches, leaflets. So two questions for you. First, what is your definition of propaganda? And to what extent are Russian people still receiving information tainted with propaganda? In Bolshevik, the thinking there is propaganda and agitation. Agitation is oral communication of basic ideas to groups of people who may not have much specific education or knowledge. Propaganda is the weaponization of truths, truths, to spread an idea and an ideology Ultimately, the idea and ideology is that the working class in Bolshevism is the way of the future and that adherence to the doctrine of class struggle will bring, dear comrades, a better world. Now, these days, there's been a transformation of this almost religious notion. The class struggle, the Bolshevism, has been replaced with Mother Russia, with loyalty to the land of ours that has suffered so much at the hands of those Westerners and Easterners. So America and militant Islam who are, have been out to get us. The Russians are masters at propaganda. And here's a, here's a way of thinking about things. Americans and Russians have very different approaches to the world and pushing their ideas on one another. We believe in hardware. They believe in software, the software between people's ears. They, we, in, in spying, for instance, our spying is by satellites and by listening devices and by pieces of code that might intercept Russian messages. Their spying is people. They human get intelligence. Human intelligence. Stalin said at one point in the 1930s, he, he said there were two approaches to things. Cadres Rishayepsio, cadres, groups of people decide everything. Ili Technica Psio Rishaya, technology decides everything. Well, America is for technology and Russians are for cadres. 
Think about that series, The Americans, about the deeply buried spies. Think about how Soviet spy masters so well understand the weaknesses in human nature that they could find Aldrich Ames, or they could find another Pentagon guy, and whether it was sex, whether it was money, whether it was vanity, play on those things. We are not very successful uh, at doing that. The Russians have been involved in a series of propaganda exercises for a very long time. Comrade X was wrong. W was that an example of the modern day use of propaganda about the uh, Chernobyl tragedy? It, it was actually a, a critique somewhat of... Uh, and, and just Chernobyl was the um, malfunction of a nuclear power station in the so in, in, in the Soviet Union, right in in the north part of Ukraine on the Pripyat uh, River, uh, that very close to Belarus, they were doing an experiment and it went out of control. The reference there was to a Clark Gable movie um, where it said, you know, Comrade X is wrong. There's no news in Russia. And there was, of course, news in Russia. And under Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, who so enticed the West with his policy of glasnost, openness, and perestroika, restructuring, and democratization, democratization, there was a notion that the Soviet Union was opening up, was its mass media was telling the truth more. But in this first early test of truth telling, in 86, the Soviet media lied to the people about the danger. It took them hours to say there had been an accident. They exposed people in Kiev to a great deal of radiation. They underplayed the danger. They didn't warn the West of what had happened. And Gorbachev uh, was not a truth teller in a crucial test under pressure. And one of the things that this article did not go into, because it was about the media then and Soviet television, was the downwind consequences. And the downwind consequences of Chernobyl were enormous because one of the peoples that suffered a great deal was in Lithuania, that was right down, the little Lit Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And in Lithuania, they saw their land being poisoned by radiation. And there was a nascent ecological movement and a nascent Lithuanian nationalist movement. And they got incensed and started demonstrating because literally Soviet science and Soviet economic might and the Kremlin was poisoning and killing their land. And this really kicked off the independence movement, the irredentist movement, that helped undo the Soviet Union and that Gorbachev did not understand. And it, it was a, a consequence. Was Lithuania, was Lithuania the first to break away? Lithuania, it, well, they all want to claim to be the first, of course, but Lithuania was in the foreground. Okay. They had their singing revolution, uh, which was, I, I, I was privileged to, to go and cover a lot of that. And, you know, they, they, there were brave people who stood up and Gorbachev uh, and the Politburo eventually sent in tanks and ran over a lot of young people who were protesting to be free and to be Western. And right now they are free and, and quite Western. And um, you know that one of the consequences of the Baltic Republics um, becoming free is uh, one of them, Estonia, freed the creative capital of their people. And we use it every day in an invention they made called Skype. F final question. Why is it that we're not hearing more about the 100th anniversary of the Great Revolution? Question, question near and dear to my heart. Uh, Putin, although a Russian patriot, although somebody who believes that one of the worst things that happened in the 20th century was the collapse of Soviet civilization, also is not a big believer in communism. He saw it was wrong. Essentially, as a military-oriented guy, he believes that the Bolsheviks undid the possibility of a Russian victory in the First World War, and that his country suffered for 70-plus years 
under a certain kind of regime that although he liked the civilization that he built, Soviet civilization was uh, wrong-headed, wrong-directed. He does believe in kind of state-controlled um, capitalism, but capitalism, not central planning, not utopian knowledge, and he's kind of dictated that the celebrations will be of Russia, not of the revolution. On the big national holiday, the 1st of September, when people celebrate the beginning of the school year, he gave a nationally televised address sent into by computers all across the, the, the country where he went into a school, and he didn't talk about the revolution, the anniversary. Um, but to, to, to go loop it back to where we started, there's a guy whose uh, his TV station was forced off the air because of his frankness, is now just on the internet, who left being in the TV and is an underground, very popular website about Russia 1917, day by day, pictures of what happened. So there is an unofficial culture clashing with the official culture. Thank you, Jonathan Sanders, for joining us. Professor Jonathan Sanders of Stony Brook University, an expert on all things Soviet and Russian. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.